Uh, we have a, uh, what I think is a pretty special treat this morning. Uh, the FCC has joined us to uh, discuss their open internet proceeding. Uh, we have with us Matthew Del Nero and Stephanie Wiener. Um, and so I'm going to hand off to them. Good morning. Thanks, Greg, and thanks for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, uh, I was uh, initially contacted by Randy Niels uh, from Amazon um, and was excited because we usually get invited to talk in the usual sort of Washington events with fellow lawyers and lobbyists and things like that. And so it was a real treat for us, frankly, to be able to talk to a group of people who actually work on the networks, who run the networks, technologists, engineers. Um, I will leave out the obvious lawyer jokes, um, but uh, I will say um, that I, I, I told Stephanie, we were talking last night, and I was like, I think I'm not going to wear a suit. Um, I thought, maybe I'll blend in if I wear you know, a, a blazer and, and slacks. And then I, I walked in, I was like, nope, I didn't blend in. <laughs> <laughs> Got it wrong. Um, but uh, Stephanie and I, uh, Stephanie is a special advisor to the FCC Chairman Wheeler on Internet Law and Policy. She's also our Associate General Counsel at the agency. I'm Deputy Chief of our Wireline Competition Bureau. And uh, there's a whole host of us working on the open internet proceeding um, across the agency. And the, the fact that you have people from our Wireless Bureau, our Media Bureau, our Enforcement Bureau, Consumer and Governmental Affairs, General Counsel's Office, Wireline, it just gives you a sense of um, our recognition that th this proceeding issues around the open internet don't fit into the neat silos that we've traditionally operated in in Washington. And I think some of that will come across today. So maybe with that, I'll give you kind of start lead off our, our presentation. We are definitely going to leave time for questions. We want to hear from you, hear your thoughts. Um, I'll also say that I want to thank uh, Tony Tauber as well. And, and Greg uh, for having us. Tony said on the way in, he was worried, you know, sometimes our group can be sort of vocal. And I, I said, that's okay. We, we've had people actually protesting in front of our headquarters. Um, and you should see some of the things I've seen in the comments to us. Um, so feel free to s speak freely to us. We, we've, we've heard a, a lot worse, trust me. Um, so uh, just to give you a background, I mean, I know you know uh, this issue very well. Um, and I don't really need to explain it to you, but I thought it might help in terms of orienting uh, you, this discussion just to explain how the FCC has discussed the issue of what we call the open internet, what's commonly called net neutrality. Um, and it's our notion, this is a very rudimentary diagram, of course, you've, you've got much better. Um, I will say the smartphone is also wildly out of proportion since it's bigger than the house there. Um, but the base, it's basically our recognition when we talk about the open internet and the reason that, that we get involved in it is the recognition that um, the internet, of course, has been uh, the preeminent 21st century engine uh, for innovation, for free expression, for economic and, and, and social uh, communication. And the key to its success, of course, is that consumers and innovators at the edge um, are free to create and determine success or failure of content, applications, services, devices. It's all without permission of any network operator. It's innovation without permission, as you all know well. Um, and there's long been a recognition in telecommunications law and policy going way back, pre-internet, um, and in including up to the present day, that control over that last mile facility to the end user um, does give the ISP, the, the, the uh, communications provider, um, the incentive and the ability to act as a gatekeeper. Doesn't mean everyone's going to behave that way. There's lots of great actors out there, but there's a lot of economic literature and technical literature basically to the effect that when you have that, that last mile control, um, a, sometimes a network operator will act in its short-term economic interest in ways that in the long term will not serve um, the interests of uh, the, the, the ecosystem. And so the notion is that the FCC has a, rule, a role and regulating to ensure that the internet remains open um, by imposing some rules of the road for the, the ISPs that serve the end users. And I will say that in general, our open internet proceedings have focused on what we call mass market broadband internet access service. So it's the service, not enterprise level, um, but the service to end users, to consumers. With that, um, and what we're gonna do is, is I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie to talk a little bit about the history 
of how we got to where we are in this proceeding, because I think it's important to understand the moment we're in right now, you know, why we're talking so much about uh, net neutrality regulation at this particular moment in time and what some of the constraints we're dealing with are. And then once she provides that overview of, of the history, I will then talk about the proposed rules that the Commission set forth in May um, that are currently being looked at. Um, and then um, we'll talk, I'll turn it back to Stephanie to talk a little bit about some of the major issues that are subject to debate in the record. And then we'll take questions. So with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Stephanie Weiner. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, now I can see you, not There's just the mic. Board. We'll have to get that. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So this is not a new issue. Uh, the commission has thinking has been thinking about openness and open access issues for a long time. Uh, we've been thinking about open internet or net neutrality issues uh, since at least 2004, um, over a decade. Uh, in 2004, then Chairman Powell gave a speech at Silicon Flatirons talking about the four freedoms of internet openness. And a year later, the commission adopted a policy statement uh, based on those freedoms. Those were that consumers should have access to the content of their choice, the applications and services of their choice, uh, be able to attach devices of their choice, and to have the benefits of competition among application services and devices. So this stood as a policy statement of the commissions. Uh, and then in 2008, the commission actually took an action uh, against Comcast on the basis of this policy statement. Uh, the um, commission uh, took an enforcement, issued an enforcement order against Comcast for their conduct with respect to the management of BitTorrent traffic. I'm not going to go into the details of that because I have a feeling you all could understand it much better than I could. Uh, but what I want to get to is sort of the overview of the history here, which we're going to do quickly, is that Comcast did challenge that order, which went to uh, the appellate court in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the key issue there is the court overturned the commission's order finding that we had not sufficiently articulated a basis for our authority to take the action we had taken against Comcast. So that, that left the commission in a quandary of sort of identifying the source of legal authority that we could use to address these open internet concerns that we had identified for a number of years. And in 2010, we adopted rules uh, which were intended to address those concerns, and we'll turn to those in a minute. But, but first, um, I'm going to do a little law. Uh, and this is because the issue of legal authority has been such a part of the Commission's policy making in this area. Uh, so it's going to be quick and hopefully relatively painless. Um, but this is a, a, a slide that shows the, how the Commission <coughs> beginning in 2002, um, began to s treat these services as a matter of their jurisdiction. So in 2002, the Commission held that cable modem services were information services rather than telecommunication services. So what does that mean? Uh, in brief terms, uh, it means that they were not telecommunication services, which are essentially pure transmission services provided for a fee to the public but rather the Commission held that they were services that were intertwined with other data processing and storage capabilities, things like email addresses, web pages, DNS routing. Why does that matter? It's because the telecommunication service definition is what, under the Commission's statute, uh, directs the Commission to regulate carriers who are providing telecommunication services essentially as common carriers. If these services are identified as information services, there's really a dichotomy here. Information services cannot be regulated as common carriers. In the years that followed, the Commission regulated or issued orders declaring that DSL services, uh, broadband over power line, wireless, wireless broadband, 
were also information services and therefore fell within the commission's jurisdiction that was outside of Title II. Most notably, in 2010, uh, the commission looked to uh, there we go. I'm having trouble. I think I hit the wrong button. Can I get slide five? I think I hit the blank button. Lawyers need help. Sorry about that. Thanks. Next time. All right. I obviously need my assistant. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, Section 706, so this is a part of our act which is outside of the Common Carriage Title II part of our act that uh, authorizes the commission to take actions to advance broadband deployment, essentially. And, and in 2010, we adopted, or the commission adopted, three basic rules. Uh, there was a no blocking rule, a rule that prohibited unreasonable discrimination, and last, a rule about transparency which required uh, disclosures of accurate information about network management practices, performance, and commercial terms. That rule applied to both fixed and mobile services. Uh, the no blocking and no unreasonable discrimination rules were subject to something called reasonable network management, and they also applied differently. The discrimination rule did not apply at all to mobile services, and the no blocking rule applied to mobile services, but in a more limited way. It applied only to, uh, it, it, what it did was it said you had to allow access to uh, websites as well as competing telephony and video services. Okay, I'm gonna try and do this correctly. The big green button, it's the correct button. The, uh, the um, basis for all of these rules really was a finding the commission made about the virtuous cir circle of innovation. This is an idea that innovations at the edge of the internet actually drive consumer demand. Think about all of the new innovations that we have seen uh, over the decade. Um, they have led more people to rely on the internet in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, that increased consumer demand encourages broadband providers, owners of facilities, to invest in those facilities and make improvements, which then in turn permits more edge provider innovation. So, I think this is the last of the legal slides, uh, but this is a big one, because this is the court decision. Uh, Verizon challenged the rules that the commission had adopted in 2010, and the court's ruling in January of this year really set the stage for the commission's recent actions with respect to open internet issues. Uh, and I'm gonna break down that court decision because there are different pieces that actually I think have uh, different consequences uh, for the Commission's authority as well as for the particular rules we adopted. Most importantly, the section of the Act that I mentioned before, Section 706, was for the first time held to be a substantive grant of authority from Congress to the FCC. Why this was so important was because the question of the Commission's jurisdiction over these services, as you remember from the Comcast case, uh, was a major issue of debate leading up through the 2010 rules until the court issued its decision in January. The court also found that it could use, the commission could use our section 706 authority to regulate broadband and to regulate the very concerns that we had identified in the open internet order. In addition, it upheld the commission's findings about the virtuous circle that I described, saying that there was substantial evidence in the record for the commission to base its rules on that justification. So all of that was, if you're the commission, a good thing. Um, on the other hand, there was a lot in the, in the order that didn't go so well for the commission. Uh, in particular, the two conduct rules that I mentioned, the rules about blocking and unreasonable discrimination, were struck down by the court. And the reasoning there goes back to the little legal discussion we had before, which was that the court held that the rules essentially treated these information services as common carriage services. Uh, it essentially read the no blocking and no unreasonable discrimination rule combined together to say that broadband providers were being required by the commission to hold themselves out indifferently 
for free to any provider, any edge provider who wanted to send traffic along the network. This, the court held, was a violation of the Communications Act, which has told the Commission that it cannot impose these types of regulations on information services providers. So, where does that leave us? Uh, or where did that leave the Commission in January? As you can see, only the transparency rule remains in place after the court's decision. Therefore, currently, with regard to the Commission's rules, there are no rules in place to regulate conduct of ISPs, broadband providers, to prevent them from taking actions that could be seen as blocking or degrading of internet traffic. And that takes us to where we are, where we were in May. And Matt's going to talk about the NPRM. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Stephanie. So that takes us, uh, as Stephanie said, to where we are. I think that that context really helps to understand the the um, backdrop against which the commission is currently looking to act. And normally, when a court strikes down an agency rule, they typically don't say, "Okay, you tried, and we're striking it down. You didn't do it right. Go away and never come back." What they do is something called a remand, and they essentially um, sort of talking in layman's terms, they, they give us another shot at it, but to do it in a way that will, we hope, withstand judicial scrutiny. Um, and so the next step then is for the commission to do this thing called the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking to essentially say, and this is how the administrative process works, whenever an agency wants to adopt a rule, is we say to the public, this is what we want to achieve. We want to achieve new rules to protect the open internet, and here's how we propose to go about it. And we sort of lay a path as to how we think we should get to that goal. Um, but we ask a lot of questions about, is that the right path to get there? Is that the best path? And that's, I, I pulled this quote out of the first page of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, which really kind of frames all of it, which is, you know, what is the right public policy to ensure the internet remains open, to protect net neutrality, or however you want to phrase it, um, and everything is, is built around that. Um, what, uh, and so what I'll go do is go through a few of the major topics and how the NPRM proposed to deal with them. It, I don't know if level three is in the audience, um, but we, we took this chart from one of your filings. I hope you don't mind. Once you file it with us, it's like fair game. Um, but we actually find this to be pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, we did give credit there at the bottom left. Um, but I've actually often used this chart, both uh, this, this graphic, both inside the building and, and sometimes outside. Um, in it, it's a, a basic diagram, but um, in helping particularly other policy folks understand kind of what, what the uh, NPRM was looking at. Traditionally, net neutrality has focused on, you know, what you all pro would probably call the on-net issues. So what does the access ISP do with the data, with, with the packets, once it's in their network? How do they deliver it to the end user? Do they block some of those packets? Do they prioritize some of them? Um, you know, on what basis do they prioritize, how do they handle congestion, things like that. Um, that was the proposed scope of the rules, because that's what we did in 2010, um, and that's how the NPRM proposed to proceed. But it did ask the question of, is that the right focus? Because already in May, we were hearing from some parties, um, some of you companies represented here probably, that there was an interest in also looking at the point of interconnection. So still focused on the access ISP and its role as I, as I mentioned is sort of the potential bottleneck. Um, but some folks are asking us to also look at the practices on the other side, right, on um, what, what, what happens at the point of interconnection um, with, uh, you know, with, with transit providers, with, um, you know, direct connections with CDNs. Um, and things like that, uh, and, and so the scope, again, proposed to focus on the last mile, but ask questions about should we rethink that? And we've certainly had a lot of meetings with companies on, uh, and, and advocates on all sides of that issue, um, both large and small. We can talk more about that if you want. Um, then, uh, we, in terms of actual, how do we, okay, so that's scope of rules. Um, what rules do we actually propose? Well, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, the transparency rule that the Commission adopted in 2010 remains in force. That's the one that the court didn't strike down. And the notion is, um, as with any sort of transparency regime, uh, and as G uh, Justice Brandeis once said, uh, sunlight is the best of disinfectants. That if you shine a light on the practices of the last mile ISP, 
um, they are more likely to behave in ways that we all think would be positive and promote innovation um, and consumer protection. And at the same time, to the extent that the practices aren't um, proper, that if where consumers do have a choice, um, they may take that information into account as they make their, their decision um, as to which ISP they want to want to use. Um, so we proposed, say, let's take that foundation that we adopted in 2010 and we think we can improve it. We think we can actually have more sunlight. Um, so we ask about things like, um, should there be more disclosure of performance? You know, things like specific disclosures of download load speeds, latency, packet loss. Um, should there be information about sources of congestion? One thing we hear a lot in informal consumer complaints, um, consumers are a bit confused sometimes about why am I not able to get to the services of, that I desire. Um, the stream, my favorite streaming video service is, is very slow. Is that because of my ISP? Is that because of my device? Is that because of the, the site itself? Um, so a little bit more education, we think, around sources of congestion could be helpful. And then questions about the method of disclosure. You know, can we get more sort of a standardized type of disclosure? Um, and the, the analogy that's been used is um, something like a nutrition label, which our uh, Open Internet Advisory Committee uh, worked on, um, uh, which Stephanie serves as uh, an advisor to um, a couple years ago, was can you have sort of a standardized like label that has some key information so that consumers can really compare apples to apples. Um, specifics on data caps and, or allowances, there's a debate over terminology there. Um, tethering restrictions, anything like that. So more information about the specific um, performance you might expect. And then lastly, um, and one that's generated a lot of discussion, um, is, is whether there should be specific disclosures, different disclosures for consumers on the one hand and edge providers and other um, stakeholders on the other. Uh, what we've heard is that the disclosures currently under the 2010 rules might be over-inclusive for consumers, meaning a little too much fine print, um, and under-inclusive for innovators at the edge who really want to understand how the network works so that they can optimize their services. Uh, so all of those are, are, have been proposed. And then, importantly, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, we had um, two big rules that got struck down. So there's no conduct rules today on the books. It's one of the reasons the commission moved quickly with the NPRM was to try to fill the gap. Um, since today, you know, if, if a uh, ISP, you know, XYZ wants to block services it doesn't like, there's no FCC rules that would pre prevent that. Um, if they want to cut all sorts of deals to favor some traffic over others. There's no FCC rules that would oversee that. That's of concern. And so there's been a proposal in the NPRM um, in May for a, a new no blocking rule and what we call the enforceable legal standard. The idea being there should be some rule that judges conduct other than blocking that might be, may or may not be problematic. And that's where a lot of the discussion around paid prioritization comes in is, is that rule. Um, although we also talked about it in no blocking, and, and Stephanie can talk a little bit about where things are in the record on, on that. Um, again, as I mentioned, the, the whole point of a notice of proposed rulemaking is to tell the public, tell the world, this is what, or at least to tell the American public, this is what we're thinking of doing, what do you think? And um, that what do you think question, we've certainly heard a lot <laughs> in response. Um, we set a 120-day comment cycle, which is actually uh, longer than average for people to comment. It ended on September 15 with reply comments, and it was the largest ever public response to an FCC rulemaking. It's over 3.7 million filings. The next closest was, and it wasn't even a rulemaking, was 1.4 million on the Janet Jackson incident. Um, and um, there's, uh, uh, I think it's good that the internet has beat out that instance. In, instance. Um, so uh, over 3.7 million, lots of different views. Stephanie will talk a little bit about sort of what's, w what some of the major topics are that, that are in that record. Um, but we've been glad, a lot of times people say like, oh, how are you, how are you getting through all this stuff? I mean, we're glad when people come in and, and that this is the whole point. This is how it's supposed to work. I'm relatively new to government and frankly, I, you know, I find it inspiring that 3.7 million people are motivated um, on this issue. Um, we've also held a series of open internet roundtables. Uh, Stephanie just co-hosted one yesterday. I did one a few weeks ago, or co-moderated one. Um, they were streamed live at our site. Um, they're also archived. I've given the site there if you want to watch any of them. They might be a little dry at times, but they go into a lot of the, the details on things like enforcement, things like uh, mobile broadband, legal issues, enforcement, et cetera. 
um, and, and we also got a lot of public participation through those. So it's been a, a robust process that's uh, still ongoing. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Stephanie to talk a little bit about some of the major issues that we've seen raised in those comments. Thanks for doing my slide for me. Um, so this is a big record. Uh, and we are working our way through it. Uh, but I just wanted to touch on some of the major issues uh, that have been reflected in the record, as well as you know, even uh, trade press, even popular press, about what kinds of uh, things people are debating about our open internet proceeding. Um, so I'm gonna touch on some of them, and then we're happy to take questions. Uh, once I'm done, if there are particular issues, either things we've said or things that you have read or have been thinking about, um, we'd be interested in your thoughts and questions as well. Uh, as Matt said, it's a pending proceeding, and so we're continuing to take in ideas. No decisions have been made, uh, but it, I think, is worth picking out a few points where it's clear uh, we have some thinking to do and there's been robust debate. Uh, the first of those is the issue of paid prioritization. Sometimes this is called the fast lane, uh, and the concern has clearly been raised in our record that people do not like fast lanes uh, and that they do not want to be stuck in a slow lane. Uh, we have been thinking through this issue really carefully. One of the things I think is uh, important to note is what do people mean when they talk about paid prioritization? My, our sense, even in our record and the paper filings, is that people are talking about that term to mean different things. Sometimes it's a very technical uh, uh, concept of advancing one type of traffic in the network management over another type of traffic. But other times people talk about it in a much broader way. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't include prioritization if it is directed by the user, uh, as opposed to by the network. Maybe it includes things like uh, exclusions from data caps, also sometimes talked about as zero rating, uh, which in their own way, though through economic terms and conditions, advance one kind of traffic, well, preferentially treat uh, one application or service over others uh, by excluding that application from a data cap. We have been thinking about what to do about these concerns. They were concerns that were raised in 2010 as well, so they're not new to the commission, but I think there's really been heightened attention brought to this issue. Uh, you would see, you know, even at the time of the NPRM and still today, we are thinking through positions about whether there should be prohibitions on this kind of conduct. But what would that mean in terms of the benefits, but uh, to consumers and others, but what would that mean in terms of innovation or uh, particularly in such a dynamic environment? Uh, we are trying to work that through. An alternative concept has been proposed that would be to have what's called a presumption uh, against these practices, which would essentially, uh, the commission would come out presuming that they are illegal, but allow folks to uh, make the case that they do not have the kind of harms that people are concerned about in a particular instance. Another issue that's really gotten a lot of attention is the issue of mobile services. Uh, in 2010, I, when I talked about it before, we, uh, the commission treated mobile and fixed broadband differently. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in mobile since 2010. This is an area that's moving really quickly. The way people use mobile services today doesn't at least from the consumer perspective, seem that different from the way they use uh, fixed services, right? If I'm looking at my uh, smart device uh, and I'm on uh, you know, an LTE network and then I walk into my home and it switches over to my wireless network, I as a consumer may not notice the difference. That doesn't mean there aren't differences in the technology, in capacity, in the architecture of those networks, but how should the commission deal with that a lot of questions about whether those differences mean that the commission should adopt different rules or retain distinctions in the rules, or whether they should be accommodated by a more precise definition of what we mean by reasonable network management. 
which is an exception to the rules, and could that concept of reasonable network management and what's reasonable differ depending upon the type of technology and service that's involved? There are a uh, big debate about enforcement, and this is something that was also talked about in our notice. And the issue here sort of comes down to whatever rules we adopt, there's going to be a need for uh, an enforcement mechanism. Uh, you know, we can only, our rules can only be effective if they're effectively enforced. And that process of how we enforce our rules has to achieve a certain amount of certainty so that providers, you all, uh, consumers, the commission sort of knows what's on what side of the line, what's permitted and what's not. That kind of certainty is something that I think regulated agencies strive for in general. But there's also a need for flexibility here. We don't want to set a rule today that's not going to work in one year, five years, ten years. We want this to be essentially future-proofed as things change, and that means you need to build in a certain amount of flexibility. And lastly, in terms of access to our enforcement processes, we recognize that there are a lot of players in the Internet ecosystem. This is not the case of uh, where there are two parties trying to negotiate a commercial agreement. There are diverse parties involved. There are diverse issues involved. With so many small players at the edges of the network, how do we ensure that they would have access? Maybe they don't have the sort of army of lawyers and lobbyists, uh, but we need an enforcement process that's going to work for them without imposing so many costs that they can't come to the commission and have their concerns heard. And the last one I'm going to touch on is legal authority, um, which you know has sort of infused this debate over the last 10 years, as I've talked about. We have uh, clearly heard a lot in the record about whether the commission should regulate uh, uh, net neutrality or um, adopt rules using Title II, that sort of common carriage approach uh, to regulation. We've heard a lot of folks who have argued that we should not do that, that this is different than the legacy telephone network for which common carriage uh, provisions were enacted by Congress. So it's, I think, began as a bit of a binary debate. More recently, we've seen some comments that look to how we could combine those approaches uh, to achieve the Commission's goals. In particular, there's been attention to um, something that came out of the court decision. The court was looking at what kind of services broadband providers uh, afford to the edge. Uh, they carry traffic, uh, the, the facility owner carries traffic from the edge of the network to its subscribers. Uh, what is the nature of that service? We're not sure. The Commission had never addressed that as a distinct service from the service that's provided to end users. What we do with that, uh, we're thinking through those theories that look to either defining that service differently from the end user service as well as theories which we'll generally call the hybrid approaches, which look to combinations of our different sources of legal authority to try and create a construct that would adopt uh, legally sustainable open internet rules that we, uh, we expect these rules will be challenged so that we, we want them to be uh, upheld in court, but also at the same time we want them to achieve the basic open internet goals that we've had for so long. You know, all of these questions, everything I mentioned so far, uh, they, as I said, no, we don't have the answers yet. We're still listening. But they're clearly all questions that are important to the commission. Uh, they are important to you, folks who run the networks. And they're important to the public, as we've seen in our voluminous 3.7 million comment record. Um, and with that, that's what we had prepared. And we're happy to take any questions. Start over here. Good morning, Matt Petak from Yahoo. So you mentioned that sunshine is the best disinfectant. Now that works whenever consumers have choices. The franchise laws and the franchise rules that are put in place in municipalities mean that in many cases there is no opportunity for competition. That sunlight cannot disinfect if there is no other alternative. You can look at the history of slavery in the U.S. and how open it was until somebody actually said, wait a minute, it's not enough to simply be out in the open. 
somebody actually has to step in and say, wait a minute, there needs to be alternatives. Is the Commission interested or prepared to weigh in on the notion of the legality of the franchise agreements and whether those should be struck down? Thank you. Um, there's a lot there. Um, let me just say first on the uh, transparency point. So um, I think there were some providers who came to the FCC back in 2010 and said there should only be transparency rules, that you don't need these other rules. And the commission found that wasn't right. They said transparency is important, but it won't take you all the way in terms of internet openness. And it did address one of the things that you, you'll find in the 2010 order that's reflected again in the 2014 NPRM is this concern that consumers, for whatever reason, may not be able to um, react. Uh, for example, switching costs might affect them, even if they have a problem with what their provider's doing. So I do want to say that the commission recognizes um, that issue. Um, there is, and Stephanie's with our general counsel's office, so will tell me if I go too far. I will say on, you raised the community broadband issue, there, there are petitions pending before the FCC right now asking the FCC um, to preempt uh, restrictions on municipal broadband that some states have adopted. When we have a pending petition like that, um, in particular, we're not really allowed to comment on it. Otherwise, other than to say that we're taking comment on it, it's, um, something obviously that, that uh, uh, the Commission is, is looking at. Um, and on the franchise, I didn't know if you meant the franchise agreement issue as separate from the community broadband issue or... Uh, no, no, that's okay. You're allowed to ask more than one. Um, I wasn't sure um, what, what, but if you can clarify what, what it was you were thinking on the, on the franchise agreements. Um. <laughs> Wow, they put these microphones way back here. Okay, so on the franchise agreements, it essentially becomes a blocker to competition. And one of the challenges whenever you have transparency is there needs to be an ability to take action based on that transparency. And in a lot of cases, the restrictions that are put in place mean that even though the consumer may say, great, I have this label, I can look at it, there's no other nutritional option on the shelf for me to select from. So no matter how badly I don't like what's on that transparency information, I, I can't go anywhere with it. There's nothing useful I can do. So that, that was my concern on the I franchise see. agreement is municipalities, localities saying, you have an exclusive build-out option. What, what choice does the consumer have in a situation like that? Right. So I don't, I don't know if I would make it as much about franchise, but if, if I can say one thing, the chairman spoke a couple, I won't make you run back again. The chairman spoke a couple weeks, or maybe even more than a couple weeks ago now, um, and did raise the concern about competition in the last mile. And in particular, uh, he spoke about how the number of competitive options, particularly we're talking on, on fixed broadband access networks, declines as you get to higher speed. So when you get to you know, say 25 megs, um, you see less competition than you might have at, at three, right? And, and we all know where uh, the needs are going in terms of, of, of bandwidth. So that's something that's definitely front and center for him. Um, he said his mantra is competition, competition, competition. He literally does say it all three times, every time. Um, so very keenly aware of that. Um, and then there's, you know, separate issue of mobile broadband. Um, and one thing the chairman has said is that he's very glad that we have four national providers and not fewer than four. Um, so with that, I don't know if you had anything to add. But we should take more questions, though. But thank you. Those were, were good. So I will ask our questioners to keep it brief. We have a number of folks at the mic in a limited amount of time. Uh, please uh, ask your question quickly. And if you would like to follow up, uh, our speakers will likely be available perhaps during the break to, to discuss a little bit further. I, I do have to say that that was pretty good because it was quickly said three <laughs> questions. <laughs> well I, done. Right. Very so uh, yeah. I'm going to try to uh, call these out. I'm going to start here in the middle with Jeff. Jeff Houston, I panic. Um, if your yeah. mantra of your, your chairman is competition, 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 Certainly the Title I framework around interconnection and peering makes a lot of sense. It's a strongly competitive market, it's open to innovation. There are certainly pressures and strictures that make sure players operate efficiently. 
But at the access market, some economists all around the world really propose that that kind of market is sub-additive. And because it's a sub-additive market, it naturally tends to aggregation and local monopoly. In which case, the entire mantra of competition, competition, competition is completely wrong. It doesn't matter what you do when there's only one provider. Why is the FCC so reluctant to actually say that's a Title II issue? That once you get to a local monopoly, your only real remedy in terms of an efficient response that gives you an efficient digital economy is to fully impose common carrier constraints on local access monopolies. Why do you think that you can wave some pixie dust in the invisible hand of Adam Smith and somehow introduce competition into a sub-additive market? Um, so I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at all the sources of authority, and the chairman himself has said that Title II is very much on the table in terms of figuring out how to address at least our open internet concerns. Uh, the heart of the open internet, this sort of, uh, sometimes it's called terminating monopoly or gatekeeper monopoly, and I think this is what you mean by, uh, you know, you can have as much competition as you want at the sort of backbone peering uh, phase of the ecosystem, but that at the heart of it, if you are constrained by your access to the last mile, the person in their home, uh, that those uh, con monopoly concerns affect the entire market. Uh, and so this, I mean, I think this is something that we have talked about and are looking at how to fix. Um, common carriage regulation, interestingly, is uh, often dovetailed with monopoly regulation, although it is different in kind. So I think there are certain actions that can be taken with regard to anti-competitive conduct uh, that actually don't necessarily require a common carriage uh, Title II finding, uh, but there are clearly things beyond anti-competitive conduct, things like freedom of expression, things like innovation that would require sort of the commission to think through how we can achieve those goals and protect those goals in the in the internet space, um, given the gatekeeper and the singling down of, you know, two, one, in some places there are no providers uh, that providing service at the level that we think and the chairman has said uh, is necessary for folks to access the internet and achieve all of, uh, obtain all of its benefits. All right, uh, over here, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Denton. I used to be a regulator at the CRTC. We oh. had this issue a few years ago, you're probably aware. Could you speak into your microphone? So my question is simply, that I believe that the courts told you that you could do what you wanted to do to protect from unwarranted discrimination if you had placed those rules under your common carrier section. So. You've, the, CR, the FCC has proceeded down a different path, proclaiming them to be information services, and the court said that's a foul. Um, are you prepared yet to get off this error, as the court has found, and put your rules back onto common carriage basis? Um, so I think, I'm, I'm not sure you and I read the court decision in exactly the same way. I guess uh, not. <laughs> but uh, like most things in the law, they're open to interpretation uh, and I think reasonable interpretations, right? I think that uh, the court clearly did say that had the commission uh, uh, regulated these services or the end user aspect of these services of the telecommunication service, then of course there would be no bar, there would be no violation with the statute. Uh, but the court also said that many of the goals in the open internet uh, sort of 2010 rules could be achieved even using the section 706 authority. It looked to what the commission had done in the data roaming context, acknowledging that it's a different context. Uh, and you know, I, I already identified some of the differences. We know there are diverse is issues, many more parties at play. 
but there, the court found that the commission had adopted a more flexible legal standard that could still achieve sort of the benefits that it was seeking uh, there to ensure that larger providers didn't uh, refuse to negotiate with smaller wireless providers or you know any other wireless providers with regard to data roaming agreements without fall without applying a common carriage standard uh, and so I think that there were a couple different things that the court said among them was your point that the nub of the issue had to do with this classification but it didn't stop there it did go on to talk about ways that the Commission might use this uh, Title I authority to achieve its goals. So that's, you're still intending on that? I think we have, not, we have not decided. It is, it is true that the NPRM, the notice that Matt talked about, contained a proposal, right? The idea um, behind that in part, though, is that the Commission wants to get a record <laughs> and we didn't know that we were going to get such a big record, but our interest is in getting a focused record. At times, the Commission has issued notices that are sort of a, an open menu of multiple options without pointing people to one to either support or attack. Uh, sometimes we say that with the notice of proposed rulemaking, the starting line is not the finish line. The point of the public comment process is for us to evaluate those comments that have uh, been uh, sort of reacting to what was proposed and the issue of legal authority is one that I will tell you remains open Thank uh, you. at the commission. Over here, Rob. Hi, uh, Rob Seastrom, uh, Time Warner Cable, speaking for myself. Uh, I'd like to offer an observation and a plea. And I have not read either of your CVs, so, so please, no, nothing, um, no personal offense meant if, if you folks are part of what I'm shining the spotlight on here. 30 years ago, the commission was dominated by engineers. And it seems that there has been a cultural change where the commission is today dominated by lawyers. And I offer, uh, as, as evidence of the, the prevailing notion as I perceive it, that anything can be negotiated, as long as it can be encapsulated in a legal agreement, it's cool. Uh, scientific realities, well, you know, whatever. I offer light squared and the debacle surrounding that as evidence of that. So my plea is, whatever you happen to give us, please give us something that's actually implementable, that we as engineers will not look at and say, oh my goodness, what is this? How can I possibly do this? Thank you. It's a fair plea. <laughs> we hear you. Um, we, we do, uh, there have been various times when um, members of the commission have noted that it would be helpful to have more engineering resources, to have more funding for engineering resources. Um, and we, we are fortunate to have folks like Henning Schulstrini, who is our outgoing CTO. We spend, Stephanie and I have spent a lot of time with him, having him explain to us what would work as a practical matter, what wouldn't. Our new CTO, Scott Jordan, um, is very much in demand to, uh, within the building also on these issues. But I hear you. Um, I think we would love to get more engineering talent in. Great. Yeah. Uh, Owen's up next, and I'm going to cap it at the three folks standing at microphones right now. Owen DeLong, Black Lotus, also speaking for myself. Um, layer one, or facilities-based services, tend towards a natural monopoly just due to the cost of deploying them versus residential density in the United States. Um, unfortunately, what has been allowed to happen is that facilities-based providers have been allowed to leverage that layer one monopoly, that, that facility monopoly, into a services monopoly. Um, for a while, we had unbundled elements that sort of tried to help with that. Uh, for some unknown reason, the FCC decided to abandon the requirement of unbundled elements. Um, what we really need to get to, in my opinion, to solve this competition problem, if the FCC really has a commitment to competition, 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 is a situation where players that are facilities providers are only allowed to be facilities providers. They are regulated as common carrier facilities providers and must provide those facilities to any service providers on equal terms. And therefore, last mile access becomes its own market, which, while it doesn't have competition, facilitates competitions at the layers that actually matter to the consumers. Thank you.
Thank you. It, it, I, I think um, the system you're describing is, for example, the system in Europe, right, in the UK, um, in Japan, a number of places. Uh, yes. Um, and it's something certainly that, that we've studied. Uh, it is notable, I mean, we're focusing here on net neutrality, open internet. Um, we have heard from folks about the European system that they have had net neutrality issues as well, um, even in that regime. That's not saying that regime is good or bad. Um, it just, even in that regime, there does appear to be some concerns about, um, about net neutrality and, and um, things like blocking and, and, and degradation. Um, but beyond that, we could probably have a much longer discussion about the history of unbundled network elements, and I, I think we probably don't quite have the time for that, but happy to chat afterwards. Okay. Joe, over here. Joe Provo, Google, speaking for myself and with a uh, historical hat of a uh, competitive broadband provider in the U.S. that Mr. PTAC denies exists, but um, <coughs> the... <laughs> Uh, I'd, I'd rather not hammer on the points that I think already Jeff and Owen amplified. Um, I would like to ask, one thing that's concerned me in the long comment period is what appears to be a scope creep of going beyond the broadband facilities and looking into the entirety of a provider's network to the point where I'm worried as an occasional purchaser of enterprise or other transport uh, transit services that I may no longer be able to buy from a Comcast or a Verizon business if they get regulated out of being able to provide that service, despite them having a lot of facilities in whatever town I want to do business in. So um, I just want to caution against the scope creep, and if you have any uh, uh, feedback on that, the, the far side of these providers' networks, that'd be nice. Yeah, thank you for the uh, comment. and. Um, uh, it is something that we have heard a lot. Uh, one of the things about the Commission's authority uh, uh, under Section 706 uh, is that it, it potentially could reach, uh, some have argued, it could reach the edges of the network, um, and that's a concern about scope we have, we have heard. I actually think you, you may have been referring to sort of the, as I think Matt mentioned, the definition of the service that we're regulating is the mass market enterprise service. Um, and uh, to date, I don't know if there have been arguments or I have not seen comments in the record yet about expanding that to enterprise services. So uh, at the moment, uh, I don't know that that has been a, a part of our record, though there are a lot of comments, so I may have missed it. What we have seen, of course, and you guys I'm sure are well aware, is uh, with the issue of scope about whether to go sort of from the on net looking at the last mile conduct to include uh, issues of interconnection that I'm sure are at the heart of what many of you work on. Uh, and folks have come in and said that uh, it's really no, some have said it's really no different that broadband providers can uh, sort of leverage their control over the last mile facility uh, to negotiate things at the point of interconnection. Others have said that that's in fact not the case, that with such a competitive market uh, it, in the backbone and transit market that that is a check on that kind of conduct. Right now, we're, again, listening. Uh, we don't know what's right. We are interested in hearing um, from you all who actually run the networks about what your experience is, but I don't think we have made it, I, I know we have not made a decision with regard to scope. Uh, the focus of the, of the NPRM was just on the last mile conduct, but given the nature of the concerns, um, the uh, chairman in the summer maybe June or July, um, did ask the staff to sort of look under the hood um, and begin to ask questions and gather information about the issues at the interconnection points. Thus far, that, though, has been outside what we are doing in the open internet proceeding. Uh, Daniel. Hi, Dan Golding, speaking only for himself. Uh, two comments. Uh, one is to, to amplify what Rob Seastrom said about expertise of the FCC. Uh, with all, all due respect to Dr. Jordan, uh, he's, he's purely an academic. 
And one of the things we've seen over the past five to 10 years, especially on the internet side at the FCC, is that the FCC has increasingly relied on academics and attorneys. And it, you know, it's been a number of years since there's been, been a member of the interconnection or internet engineering community who's not an academic with no operational experience available as a resource to the FCC. And so what the FCC does is you get members of this community in to periodically give talks and, and provide information. Um, considering the scope of, of the internet and its importance to our economy and, and the level of interest from the public in these issues, um, I, I'm gonna suggest as a citizen that that's simply not enough at this point in time and that, that you must enhance your expertise in the same way that you have significant wireless and spectrum expertise that's, that's on your staff every day. These guys are, and gals are total experts. They're, they're the top experts in their field in spectrum that is not going on, on the internet side. It's, it's not acceptable. Um, the, the second point I, I wanted, openness and transparency. Um, the requirements on carriers, on broadband providers, on content providers for openness and transparency at this point are not sufficient. The public debate on network neutrality, on peering, on not being able to get your favorite streaming service is hampered both in terms of lawmakers, in terms of policymakers, and in terms of average citizens because the, the graphs and the data and the information that show the edge between these providers, that information is secret, it's under NDA, and in some cases contracts exist where carriers have, or, or hosting providers have to certify they will not provide the information to government regulators upon request. I, I don't believe that's even legal. Um, I guess my request to you is it's great to maybe say, you know, you're gonna be a common carrier. Those are big, big steps, and there's significant legislative possibilities for pushback and changes in the FCC's mission if that happens. But it's very, very difficult for a lawmaker or for a corporate executive to push back against you when you demand greater openness and transparency. So opening up peering, saying peering is not a secret anymore. Who you peer with, where they peer with, how much packet loss you have at the edge, how much capacity you have. Um, consumers should have a right to know that. And it's the one thing you could do that would probably have little pushback from the legislative side. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So those are both points well taken. On, on the first one, as I said, we would obviously love to have more, more engineering resources. Um, one commissioner has proposed a sort of an engineering honors program. Um, and the way we have a legal honors program, again, there's some funding issues there. But I, I do hear you. We, you know, as, as lawyers who aren't uh, experts in internet architecture, the more resources we can get, uh, the better. Um, the second point um, in terms of transparency and disclosure, I mean, we're not excited when we, we hear about contracts that expressly have a provision that they, you know, can't be shared with the FCC except uh, under a subpoena that's fought at every level. Um, you know, the, Stephanie mentioned the chairman's directive to us to better, to try to better understand uh, peering in interconnection markets. And we issued uh, some voluntary data requests. Um, some providers were more helpful than others uh, on those. Um, but we, we certainly, just for our own benefit, um, find it helpful when information is available. And, and we agree that, and, and part of the role of the transparency rule, it probably doesn't, there, there may be issues in going as far as you want to go, but we, we definitely want to get closer to uh, greater transparency in those markets than, than we have today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Matthew, Steffi, thank you very much for coming here today. This is wonderful. Thank you.